Marlene Parada uh, has, uh, has just finished her MASC thesis and is going to be presenting it uh, uh, <coughs> on, well, you can read the title. Uh, she, had to go all, she had to go all the way all, all the way to Montevideo to get data to work on this. Uh, but, uh, we, we actually have an ongoing relationship with the Latin American Development Bank and have been some projects in places like Asuncion and Montevideo. Um, you, you could do the presentation in Spanish maybe just to, uh, <laughs> no? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, turn, turn, turn it over to you. Uh, hello everyone, thank you so much for coming. Uh, my name is Catalina, for the ones who don't know me. I, uh, for the past year and a half, I was, I've been working on this project which was very interesting, I find it very fulfilling, and uh, I discovered a lot of things about automated fare collection data and the, you know, and the use and how we can use it for transportation planning. So this is kind of like what's going to be the topic of my presentation. Uh, the title is Analysis of Analysis of Automated Freight Collection Data from Montevideo, Uruguay for Planning Purposes. Um, just give me one second um, to see the presenter view here. But it doesn't show the presenter view. Okay, uh, I'll just. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I see. <laughs> oh. Now we want to be opposite. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> uh, okay, do it again. I, I, I just changed the one. Okay. <coughs> okay. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> Thank you, Luna. Um, so first, let's start with automate, uh, automated for collection AFC systems. These are the systems where we get AFC data. Uh, these systems were designed to efficiently collect fare. Uh, so think about Presto Card. Uh, you go, you tap your card, you get in. You don't have to interact with any human. It's efficient and it's convenient for users. Um, the the system here in Toronto, as well in Montevideo, it's a system where you only validate your transaction as you board. Uh, you don't have to tap your card when you get off. Uh, we'll refer to the getting off as a light for this presentation. And even though these systems were originally designed to collect fares, uh, they actually collect a lot more data than that. Uh, it collects locations, times of transactions, users ID for um, people who have smart cards. Um, in Montevideo, we have a particular case where the system doesn't only collect the data from uh, smart cards, uh, but also collects the data for users that don't pay with a smart card. So if you pay with cash, the system will record this transaction and we give you a little receipt with the details about the location, uh, the time of your transaction, and the route you're taking. Uh, this is quite unique for, for, for automated freight collection systems. Um, and as I mentioned, um, whether, whether you pay with a smart card or with cash, or with cash you get a receipt from the machine. Um, when, um, when individuals are boarding the buses, they also get to select what kind of trip they want to make. So there's two different kinds of tip, trips. You can do a one hour or a two hour trip. If you pay for a one hour trip, uh, it means that you can make as many transactions within an hour and the same for, for two hours. Um, so now, the location of this study is in Montevideo. Montevideo is the capital city of Uruguay in the southeast of Latin America. Um, the transit system in Montevideo is a bus only system. It has 144 bus lines and over a million and 200,000 transactions per day. Uh, it serves the city of Montevideo, which is around this area, but it also serves the department of Montevideo, so like a province, uh, which is this and uh, some areas in the neighboring departments. Uh, Candelon is over here and uh, San Jose uh, behind the big map. <laughs> um, so this automated freight collection data had not been available for research purposes and we're able to get our hands on this data. So we started looking at the literature and see what has been done 
um, in terms of analysis of this data. And uh, we set up three objectives that we wanted to attain with this study. The first one is to recreate bus itineraries. So for Montevideo, there's no um, GTFS, ABL data. This is scheduling data in like a text or a CSV format that can be used um, for, for analysis of schedules. So we don't have this for Montevideo. So we're gonna try to recreate the itineraries just using uh, our AFC data. Uh, the second goal is to estimate the alighting locations. Uh, so we'll call these origin destination OD estimation for short. Uh, and the third goal is to try to pair the smart cards with individuals from the travel survey. So travel survey um, for Montevideo is called the Montevideo Household Mobility Survey. So it's a survey that um, interviews a sample of individuals and asks them about their demographics and their travel behavior. So for our study, we're interested, we're interested in matching those individuals that ride transit with uh, the smart cards to get some of the information from the household, um, from the demographics to, to our smart card. Uh, that I said. Uh, and for the study, we developed three methods to uh, attain these goals. So we used not only the AFC data, but we also used uh, data about the bus network and, of course, the travel survey. For the AFC data, we uh, had a whole week, seven days, uh, worth of data for a week in August 2016. <clears throat> So the remaining of my presentation is organized as follows. We talk about the bus itinerary method. We then touch on the OD estimation and we close with the pairing of um, the respondents of the travel survey with the smart cards. Uh, but before we apply these methods, uh, we need to do the most important and most time consuming, mm -hmm. uh, not very fun process that is data <laughs> cleaning. Mm -hmm. So um, for this, we need to prepare the data of the AFC transactions. Uh, we need to look at the bus network, if there's any errors, and also the, the household survey. Uh, so first off, we look at the AFC records, um, and all records, a smart card and no card, are, uh, have certain um, data, such as the boarding location and the time. The location is given at the stop level. And we also know what bus run a passenger boarded. So this, would, this uh, bus run would be associated with the bus ID and the bus branch that is being served. Um, moreover, for a smart card, we have additional information. We are given the number of transfers per, per, per paid. So if a user pairs for a one hour trip and makes two transactions, then the system would tell us that it was a transfer and they would tell us that you know, those trips are associated and um, considered as together as one trip. Uh, we also know the passengers per transaction and the transactions per day uh, for each smart card. Using this um, characteristics, we um, identify some query criteria. So for all the records, a smart card and no card, we want to remove those that are void and those that occur at stops that are unknown. Um, so they're not geocoded on the system, therefore we don't really know where, where a person boarded. And for a smart card, uh, we analyze the travel patterns of all the smart cards throughout the days, and we see that for almost all the passengers, uh, the, their transfers per trip are less than five. Um, they have less than five passengers per transaction and less than eight transactions per day. So we use this as a query criteria to only, um, to only select the smart card users that have like a normal travel behavior. Uh, once we apply this query, we are left with 98% of the no card transactions and 97% of smart card transactions. Um, the biggest share of records that had to be removed was uh, because they were at stops that were not geocoded. Um, for the bus network, we do not only <coughs> look at the, at the stops that for which we don't have coordinates, but there's another uh, very important thing that it, we will call in this study invalid bus branch. So an invalid bus branch is a bus branch 
for which we don't know the direction and we don't know what stops are served by, by this bus. So this could, this was most likely due uh, by like a change in uh, branch IDs and then things of that sort that's kind of like out of our hands. Uh, we realize that we have a big problem because 55% of all the branches are invalid. Um, so we would not know where passengers are going because we don't know the direction of the bus branch. Once we looked at how many transactions occur on these invalid branches, we see that for 15% of no-card passengers and 24% of smart card passengers, um, they board at invalid bus runs. Um, so we're gonna try to recover some of these data uh, just because it represents quite a big share. And to do that, we propose like a little um, procedure. Uh, so the procedure consists on finding a uh, bus run that is valid and that is similar to one of the invalid runs. So how do we know that, how, how do we do that? We compare the stops. So we looked at the AFC records that occur at like each invalid run and we get the bus stops in this uh, dots in yellow and then we try to see which one of the valid runs covers all those stops. Uh, so for instance, um, it might be a little bit hard to see from the back, but um, there's a stops in this corridor that belong to a certain valid branch. And then we actually match a valid branch that stops at the same stops. So we assign that valid bus branch as to the invalid run, and we call that validator runs. Uh, this might sound a little bit confusing, but it's basically we're just trying to um, recover some of the, the bus branches for which we don't have information. And if we do that, uh, the original 55% of invalid runs is now reduced to 34%. Uh, this, of course, has some implications on, on our methods uh, because you know we're just trying to fix data and we um, it might not be the best way to do it, but uh, this is what we have at the moment. Um, but I'll talk a little bit about the impacts of considering valid, uh, bus, like validated bus branches in our results. Um, finally, we also clean the household survey. So we only want to keep uh, the riders that use the transit system in Montevideo. Um, the household survey is done for this area that is exceeds the boundaries of what is served by the transportation system. So, so we get rid of the passengers that don't use our transit system. Um, so now let's go into our first um, method is recreating bus itineraries. Uh, as I said previously, we don't have uh, any data for scheduling that we can use for analysis. So we're like, oh, we have AFC boarding records. We could use them to know what time a bus arrives at certain stops, just using them. Also, if we have the itineraries, we're gonna be able to um, compute travel times and transfer times and, and things that are related to time that we could not complete if we didn't have the bus itineraries. Um, so here is a schematic example of our algorithm that um, identifies bus itineraries. So the stops with the circles are stops for which uh, they're boarding records. So and the stops with just the little buses are stops where the bus doesn't stop, uh, or I mean, it doesn't stop to pick up passengers. So we don't have uh, AFC data. Uh, as one would imagine, there's quite a bit of boardings at the beginning, but once it approaches the end, there's no boardings. Um, so our method consists on first computing the average time for each of the stops with boardings um, to determine that as the stop time. And then uh, for the ones where we don't have boarding records, we interpolate between, um, for instance here, we interpolate between those two of these stops to compute the time of that uh, intermediate stops. And then for the end, we forecast the times based on the time step. So if we have, if we use like a, if there's a 10 second um, time step between these stops, we use it to forecast the time of arrival at the subsequent stops. Um, so from like a more general standpoint, what we did was uh, we clustered the AFC transactions by bus run and by stop, and we computed the average time. Uh, this is not done for terminals or for the first and last stop as bus routes because 
the time that they spend there is not necessarily um, com cannot necessarily be computed by the by the boarding demand, um, but it's like determined by the operator. So um, before we compute the average time, we want to remove outliers, and we try to identify the stops that have unusual dwell times. So these are, um, you know, uh, it doesn't make sense that a bus is stopped at a certain stop for two minutes uh, and picks up one passenger, unless, you know, it's a terminal. Uh, so we also want to identify those stops that have, like, just unusual stop times. Um, this methodology has been proposed by um, uh, Fury uh, in Singapore for for the bus for the bus system. I mean, they have like a multi-model, but they've used this for uh, computer itineraries for buses. And um, some other researchers also in Singapore uh, have actually um, developed a full dwell time model using uh, AFC data. So. <coughs> To determine what is a unusual dwell time, we rely on uh, first the Transit Capacity and Quality Service Manual, and this manual recommends a passenger service time. So passenger service time is how many seconds per passenger is considered acceptable. Uh, and this is of four seconds. Um, if we apply it to our data set, we have to get rid of 70% of AAC records because uh, everything else would be considered unacceptable dwell time. So this might not be the best indication for our data set. Um, so then we try to find some, if there's some sort of pattern for stops that have like a high service time, uh, if they occur at a certain location or a certain time or a certain bus routes, um, we can't find because it, um, there's, initial, um, there's high dwell times for all the stops and all routes and at all times. Um, there's not really a pattern. So what we do is uh, we plot the dwell time to the passenger boardings. Uh, and what we find, well, we find there's a trend. Uh, so it means that for more passenger boardings, um, the dwell time increases. So if you have one person, the bus, you know, might take one second, but if there's 20 people, the bus, you know, is gonna stop there for, let's say, 30 seconds. Um, but the R score is not very good. It's, um, 0.38, and then, but this is kind of like the best indication that we can use to, to say what is an acceptable dwell time. So we use what um, the slope of the graph that is um, 10 seconds, and we say that 10 seconds per passenger boarding is acceptable. Um, this is quite you know subjective, uh, but given the data that we have, um, this is kind of like the best we could do. Um, so now we, what we can do is we can see what stops have um, really high passenger service times. Uh, so the stops in bright blue and uh, bright pink are stops that have um, over 60 seconds per passenger. Um, so it's quite, it's quite high and it's not, this is not considering term, like we're n this is only showing stops that are not terminals or the first or last stop of route. So, um, of course, like it needs further investigation to see what is actually happening at these stops that you know they're spending so much time and not a lot of passengers boarding. Um, so once we remove the stops that have outliers and we disregard those that have initial dwell times, we can create uh, bus itineraries. Uh, so this is kind of like what it would look like. Um, the Cells that don't have any, that, that are just like white, are uh, stops for which there were boarding records. Uh, the ones in blue are those that we interpolated uh, because there's no passenger boardings. Uh, the ones in gray, we also interpolated because they had like a high dwell time, so we didn't consider them, but we interpolate the time of, for them. And the yellow ones at the end of the bus route are those um, that we forecasted. <coughs> Uh, so next is the origin and destination method. Uh, even though we'll call it OD estimation, the idea of this um, different like strategies uh, are going to be to identify the alighting location for uh, smart cards and also for uh, non-smart card passengers. So, 
So this is kind of like how the this kind of like section is breaking down into. Uh, we have some methods for smart cards. Uh, we can trace the smart cards based on their ID, and then we have no card. So for them, we only have like a picket number. And for the smart cards, we have uh, those that have multiple transactions in a day, and those that are just like a single ride. So just one transaction transaction per day. Um, some methodologies have been developed by uh, uh, Trepanier, that was the earliest one, also in Chile, Beltran, and they have been validated uh, using a data set using tap on and tap off data in Australia by Elsger and others. Uh, so basically we we built our method uh, based, on, based on previous work, uh, but we also add some considerations that are um, unique to our data. Um, this, it's important to, uh, to, say, to mention that these researchers have mostly looked at the OD estimation for smart cards that have multiple transactions. Uh, few of them have looked at single writers, and uh, there's actually no studies about uh, no card. I'll explain why once we get there. So <clears throat> this is the kind of like information we will get from AFC. Uh, we have the places where people board it in like the dots with like a red circle around. And we, from the bus network, we can tell in what direction and what are the stops where a bus route is going. So if a person boarded here, we know what direction and the following sto stops in that bus run. Um, then the system, if it identifies as a transfer, is gonna tell us this is part of the same trip, but just a different leg. So this is what's happening in these two first green. And then the next thing we know is the next transaction. Um, the, the location of the boarding of the next transaction, so that would be origin number two. So what our method does is, uh, well, oh. What our method does is it's going to look at the next transaction, at the next boarding transaction, and it's gonna try to find the stop in the bus route that minimizes the walking distance. Um, so for instance, here, um, this was a transaction, then uh, the person got on here, so the algorithm finds the transaction that is closest to the next boarding. Um, similarly here, uh, the next boarding occurs at this red spot, so the algorithm finds the stop that minimizes the, the walk-in distance and assigns that as the destination uh, or as the alighting location. Uh, for, you know, we do this for a smart cards that have multiple transactions, so we're able to just look at the next transaction's boarding and determine the alighting of the previous one. And we do this for all the transactions. Uh, note here that for the last transaction of the day in purple, um, it identifies the destination based on the morning, uh, well, the first transaction's boarding. Um, so, um, as you would imagine, there has to be some considerations to be able to make reasonable uh, decisions in terms of what is considered an uh, unlikely location um, and what is considered, what we will consider as a transfer and what we want. Just because, you know, you can make as many transactions as you want with, with a fare that you pay, you can make multiple trips. So we're gonna try to determine we, we're gonna try to identify some of these strips as well. Uh, so first, um, we allow a maximum walking distance of one kilometer. Um, so this would be this distance right here between alighting and boarding. We only allow people to walk actually one kilometer. Uh, and the maximum transfer time, we set it at 30 minutes. Um, this has been validated by uh, Oscar and um, some of our researchers. So what happens is that if a person spends more than 30 minutes at a location, there must be an activity going on here, going on there. So instead of considering that as a transfer, we consider that as like a, a trip standalone. Also, if a passenger takes um, the same bus line in the same or opposite directions, we don't consider that as a transfer, but we consider that as a trip. So for instance, if a person takes a bus in one direction, gets up and then takes the same bus, we can safely assume that there was activity going on there because otherwise there would be no reason for the passenger to, to get off. And same, if the person goes to a place and then takes the same bus line to get back, uh, 
you know, there would be an activity. So there is not a transfer, but you know, two different trips. Um, we apply this algorithm to all the seven days of data that we have. So all the smart cards that have multiple transactions. Um, so um, this, the smart cards that for which we could do this are about around 50% of all the smart cards. And this happens because uh, around 40% of this, 30% uh, of the smart cards had transactions on invalid rounds. So we couldn't apply this method to those and we need to get rid of those. And then like a 10% were, were people that only pay, uh, had only one transaction per day. Um, so these are the results for the smart cards that have multiple transactions and all their transactions are invalid and validated runs. Uh, we estimate the alighting location for almost 88% of transactions for all the weekdays. Uh, this is quite high um, compared to other studies that have done like a similar approach. Um, and we can attribute this actually to the quality of data uh, in terms of collecting the stop and the time and the bus run. Uh, for 67.5% of the smart cards, we can estimate a complete trip. We can, we can, we have complete trip chain complete trip chain. So that means that all their transactions, they made use of transit, we, we can estimate the alighting. So we know the boarding and the alighting. So that would be considered like a trip chain. Um, I mean, but this, like, we know the boarding and alighting of all their transactions for one day. Uh, so that's like a trip chain. Um, the average walking distance is uh, 179 meters. Uh, the average onboard time is almost 19 minutes. And the average trip time is 30 minutes. Um, we get the onboard times and average trip times using the uh, data from the bus itineraries we built. Um, <clears throat> so the next step in our method is to incorporate uh, the people that only have one transaction per day that are single riders, and those for which we could not <coughs> estimate their alighting location using the previous method. Um, the strategy is to identify similar transactions for these passengers in other days for which the alighting location could be estimated. Um, the, some of the works that have uh, touched on this topic are these reser researchers and a couple more. Um, and they have kind of like tried to identify what can be considered as a similar transaction. Um, so for our study, for a transaction to be similar to another, it has, uh, we set up a temporal and a spatial window of uh, one hour and one kilometer, and the passenger must board on the same bus line. So for instance, if I take the Spadina street car on Monday at 10 a.m. at Spadina College, and on Tuesday, I take the same street car, but instead of taking a Spadina College, I take a Spadina Harbord, and instead of taking at 10 a.m., I take at 10.30, that would be considered a similar transaction. Um, so these are, these are um, quite subjective. Uh, we go with the higher end for the windows um, that of what has been proposed in the literature. Um, using this methodology, we're able to <coughs> assign an alighting estimation for 20% of the single riders and around 13% of uh, the transactions that are incomplete. Um, and interestingly, once we looked at the like the similar transactions in other days, we see that most of these riders only have a similar transaction in one other day, uh, and you know, two, three, or four days they don't have similar uh, transactions that that look like. Um, so the second part of the method that this hasn't been explored before uh, because. Um, it has been said that passengers that don't have a smart card have different travel behavior than the smart card users. Uh, so th these people have not been looked at before. Um, there's not really an actual study where the differences in travel behavior have been studied. Um, so we decided, well, we can try to incorporate them in our methodology, just assuming that the travel behavior is the same and let's see what happens. Um, so we did this by uh, studying the lighting patterns of um, the smart card users. 
for by bus branch and time period for all the uh, weekdays and the weekend. Then we assign weight factors uh, to the volume of alightings. So if, for instance, if at a bus branch 20% of the passengers get up at a certain stop, uh, we will assign a weight of 0.2. And then we assign the alighting stop for no card based on this weight factor. So if 20% of smart card users got up at a certain stop, we will say that 20% of non-smart card users got up at that stop. Um, this, uh, of course, are like a big assumption just because we really have no idea about the travel behavior of uh, people that don't have a card, but we just decided to integrate them for, uh, to create the following, <laughs> to, um, to be able to create both load profiles. So both load profiles indicates um, what are the boardings per stop and then how many people get up or alight each stop. And we can see the, the amount of people that are at the stop at, uh, at different places. So in black, we have the boardings. In green, we have the alightings. And this, this pink line is um, how many people are on board. Um, so we can see that a lot of people board at the beginning, and then we have three big jumps here. Uh, so these are stops that are um, that have the most alightings uh, for smart cards. So then non-smart card users also have like a big share of alightings. Um, um, a person told me that it looked a little bit different than what he had expected because usually these uh, high loads would occur at the end. Uh, but in, um, just because the, some buses tend to end their uh, branches at downtown. Uh, however, a, lot, a couple of branches in, in Montevideo pass through downtown and then go somewhere else. So we have like a, um, a high um, load in the middle. Um, so I'm, I'm sure you were wondering what do we do with the alighting estimation. And uh, this is used to create OD matrices. Um, so here we see like a map of uh, the trip origins during the AM period. Uh, so this is for smart cards. We see that they board all over the city, some suburban and some more um, areas are like quite far from, uh, from the city over here and over here. Uh, and then this next slide is shows the trip destinations. So we see that they're mostly in downtown and then there's some places over here and then uh, over there. Um, I just, out of curiosity, I looked in Google Maps, you know, why there are, um, why people alighted there. And uh, I found, you know, a couple of things like industrial zones or airports or just like a street that has a lot of businesses. Um, so it's kind of like interesting to see these patterns and how people travel on the network. Um, another thing that we can look at is the transfers per stop. So these graphs show the volumes of transfers in the PM period at a stop level. Um, so we can see that some of the terminals have like a very high transfer volume, but there's also some stops that are not terminals and some corridors that have a high alighting, um, high transfer volume. So this could be like explored further by the transit agency. Um, just to see why this is happening and if they need better infrastructure for the transfers or, uh, you know, um, what's going on. Yeah, what's going on. Um, so <laughs> the final method of this study is we're going to try to pair the transit riders from the travel survey with the AFC or smart card records. So uh, these two data sets are inherently different. Um, so the MHMS and uh, household surveys usually collect demographics of like a sample of people that are interviewed and their, um, their trips. So this includes like where they're going to and from, what time, what mode they use, and what was the purpose of their trip. Uh, for the smart card data, we don't have any of that demographic or trip purpose data. All we have are when transactions occurred. Um, so we try to match these two data sets using the smart cards that have complete trip chains. So if we can see that um, 
if we can trace their transit transactions and basically their trips throughout the day, we want to see if we can find these people, uh, well, the opposite, if we can find the, the transit riders of the survey in the smart card data set. Um, so these data sets are compared in different factors, such as location. Uh, so for the travel survey, these are assigned to a um, census level that is called census segment. Um, so this is kind of like the little squares, uh, shapes that you saw in the maps uh, previously. Well, like at the smart card, we have the stop level. Uh, for time, we, it is reported by the individuals that are surveyed and it's reported as the start and end of trips. Uh, we can compute the boarding time and lighting time by um, computing, well, they also report their walking time and waiting time. So we can, we can like try to estimate what time they got off at a bus and what time they, they got on and got off. Uh, for the smart card, we have um, the time precise to the second. We only consider the boarding time because that's the one we're, we're sure about. Um, the bus line, both data sets collected and the travel survey doesn't collect the smart card ID. Uh, so this is what is going to be the goal of this methodology, is to identify, is to see if uh, some of these transit riders, we can find their smart cards. Um, we can find them like in their smart card data set. Uh, this has been attempted by uh, Esper um, and, and Regal in MIT. Um, they, they don't have a high success rate, um, so we didn't expect good results, but uh, we'll see. <laughs> uh, okay, um, so there's some limitations for, for doing this pairing process. The first one is we have a very small sample. Uh, we only have 864 individuals that ride the transit system um, from the survey and have more than one transaction in transit. Uh, and the other limitation that is like a more important one is we don't know the date when the individuals were surveyed. Um, the, the survey for Montevideo is done by person, so a person goes and knocks on doors. So it could be done for a, a period of weeks. It was actually for a period of weeks, but we don't know what exact date households were interviewed. Um, so when the other studies that I um, at Spur and Regal, they actually had the date and they got um, some pairing rates of 40 and 50%. So we were expecting lower than that just because we don't know the date of uh, the surveys. Um, for the pairing process, we use two strategies. First, we try to match these uh, users only using the boarding location and time. And the second strategy is we use the boarding location and, and the lighting. The location for boarding and alighting and the time for boarding only. Um, this, is, this should be using location for boarding and alighting and time <laughs> for boarding. Um, so we use a variable time window for pairing. Um, and so we try to find users, uh, we try to find the individuals that write transit in this marker data that have similar transactions in terms of location and time and then we allow like a certain range of time uncertainty. So this is what I mean by uh, time windows. And the pairing process is applied for each day, just because we don't know what date the, the households were surveyed. Um, Monday and Wednesday had the most matches. So this is a, an example of what we saw from, from Wednesday. Uh, as you can see, using a 30 minute window, we see that the pairs using the board and the light and only using the board are quite similar. So we have 69 and then we have 71 pairs that are, uh, that are equal. And then the um, increased rate here, this color means how many more people could we capture if we only use it, if we only use the board method where we only look at the boarding location and time. Um, and then as you would imagine, as we expand the time window, we get more matches, uh, we get more pairs uh, but it's, this is still significantly low. The matching rate is around 10% using the 20 and 30 minute window and about 15% with the 60 minute window. Um, okay. uh, so as we did the pairing method for each day, 
we want to see we like um, for how many days these pairs these like transit riders are assigned to the exact same card for for different days um, so if a person was paired with like a smart card let's say one to three on Monday uh, and also on Tuesday and on Wednesday uh, we would say this person has um, it would fall in this this category uh, a pair that has uh, that are, that is the same pair for three days. Um, kind of like I don't know if this necessarily well, like it's a little bit hard to explain, but it's basically it's like for how many days the pairing process assigns the same smart card ID to an individual. Um, and interestingly, we see that if we only consider the boarding, uh, a lot of, uh, time and location, we get more pairs. But uh, these pairs are only similar, um, are mostly similar for one and two days. But if we use the boarding and the lighting location and the boarding time, we see that we're able to capture some pairs that this could indicate that there's some sort of uh, regularity in, in using transit for their trips. Um, okay. <laughs> so uh, I should have shown this before. Uh, but yeah, basically it's, uh, it's indicating how the total pairs just using the boarding and lighting and time is higher than the pairs for using the boarding and the light. But yeah, we capture a lot more individuals that um, in three, four, and five days. Um, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, an interesting part of the survey is that it asks individuals how many days per week do you make a similar trip? And um, there was no much difference between the match between the reported frequency and uh, the pair frequency. So this would be a pair frequency. Um, I, I should have mentioned. <laughs> okay, um, so now that we've covered the three methods, uh, let's talk a little bit about like inclusions of this study. Um, the bus itineraries were using like a 10 second acceptable service time. Um, and this was subjective, but we were able to, using this method, um, uh, capture 90% of the passenger records and assign a lifetime times for 96% of transactions. Uh, these results can be cross-examined with the scheduled data that is not available for Montevideo, but once we were doing this study, that data wasn't available. Um, the next conclusion is that the OD estimation for a smart card was quite successful uh, with uh, almost 88% success rate. It's significantly higher than any other systems. And um, there is, of course, need more need um, we need more need, uh, more data to study transit regularity. So once we assign like the time windows and the spatial windows, this would be better if we can do it for several weeks instead of just using one week of data. Um, the OD estimation for no card, this is something that we attempted to do, but it needs to be validated uh, just because we don't know what how different the behavior of no card users is uh, from the smart card users' travel behavior. And uh, finally, we were expecting a matching load rate for the uh, travel survey with the smart cards. Um, so, you know, we can make several suggestions about collecting the smart card ID on travel surveys. Um, but w if we do that, uh, we would be expecting like a 40 or 50% uh, matching rate as other studies have, have done. Um, for future work, uh, well, AFC and other advanced data collection data, a ITS data, uh, are a hot topic right now to integrate in transit planning and uh, for just evaluating transit systems. Um, the AFC data, so this is kind of like data set that I've been talking for almost an hour, uh, can be used <laughs> for transit planning and system operation and evaluation of the transit systems. And uh, of course, there's limitations with, with the AFC data set because it only records details about transactions. Um, but these limitations, so not collecting demographics or not collecting trip purpose, uh, could be overcome with onboard surveys or just uh, validating and calibrating our methods. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Oh,
we do have time for a few questions. So the, I felt very good about the graphs. Um, so the matching procedure that was not very successful. Um, so there were a few numbers of the successful matches consecutive days in a row. Mm -hmm. And there was like one, one day in a row all the way down. So was there any cases where, um, where two different people got matched with the same card in two, in two consecutive days? Like one day, one person got matched that card. Oh. Next day, someone else got matched that card. Or do you just not count those? Uh, yeah, so, so that happened. Um, that happened and, and we, so what the method does is that if a person was matched for day one and then for day two, that person is the, like one of the potential matches, we select the person um, if, if they've had, if they've been paired before with, uh, it's right. yeah. Oh, sorry. Could you go back to your uh, new well time regression model? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, give me a sec, yeah. Oh. Uh, uh, let me, like, tell me when to stop. You good? Yeah. There. Okay. Um, so, I'm assuming that you just sort of did a very simple regression, you uh, regressed well time against number of passengers. Did you try any sort of transformations? So, like to me, that looks sort of like a, a log normal sort of distribution of the well time based on passengers. So did you try anything like that, or was it just sort of straight well time to number um, of uh, boardings? Yeah, no, I, I tried some of that, but um, so the thing is that here, even though, as, as you said, like it, it looks like uh, like a no normal distribution, these are actually uh, on terminals. You know, we're looking at passenger boardings of 160, or they they're just <coughs> like um, th like there were these these actually these last ones were found to to not be useful because um, um, they like occurred at, at one stop for like three hours. Um, okay. So then, you know, some of these were removed, and then, uh, yeah, I tried doing different plots, but actually, uh, there was no, not, not no much success. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. This is great. It's really, really interesting. I have two questions. One clarification: uh, in the OD estimation, you talked about walking distance. Um, you only are doing ODs from when they get on the bus and when they get off the bus. So it's walking distance at transfer points between two different transfer lines. I, mean, I didn't uh, understand that. Yes, yes, sorry, yeah, it's, it's the walking. So the one kilometer would be this distance. So, so we're yeah, trying so they're to- they're walking a long distance for transfers or they're doing shopping in between or something else. Uh, well, actually, I mean, it, it, one kilometer might seem long, but uh, these uh, researchers, Oscar and others, they used that top on top of um, data set from, um, I think it was Queensland in Australia, and they found out that 800 meters was reasonable. Um, yeah, yeah, this is not transfer, so it's, she's trying to impute where they got off on the first trip given the origin on the next trip. So, so like the green, you know, one, one trip is from origin to trans so that you see the transfer, but then you don't see where they get off that line. The next thing you see them is tapping on on the red line. Yeah. So, okay. so she's, trying to find, she's trying to impute what was the, the, the way oh, the stop see. on the first trip given the boarding stop on the tap on the second trip. So yeah, so that's where the point is. It could be a stop that's within a kilometer of that. Well, if it's not a transfer, it's the next day. No, no, it's the same day. Same day, but it's a, it's a separate trip. Right. Uh, not a transfer. Because on the smart card, you see, uh, uh, smart, smart card, you see transfers. Yeah, I'm not sure. It's not walking distance. It's not access time to the house or anything because it's between two stops. Yeah, so two that, trips, that, that, I'm not quite sure what that shows. Well, there might be a, you know, let's take that case. So there there might, might, might be a store that's oh, right. halfway in between. Right, yeah, but, but yeah. it doesn't really give a lot of information. Yeah. Access to the system from yeah. house 
Yeah, well, yeah, that's no, not no, 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 yeah, yeah, ODs here are stop to stop. No, yeah. I understood that. And, and the yeah. other one is the, the matching. I mean, you spent a lot of effort trying to match individuals in the mm -hmm. third set of algorithms, you know, set of third methodologies. Just, I mean, I understand the first two very well, and that's really useful stuff. Mm -hmm. I'm a little confused because if you've got the OD matrix and you have a serve, you have a, you know, a, a broad regional survey with census data and specific socioeconomics, you know, mm -hmm. of each, you know, each zone. What's what are you getting by trying to do such a matching of individuals in that model? You mean for? But what would it be? For for its smart cards or for no, are you thinking the about effort that? To make just to match individual uses of smart cards with individuals oh. in the survey. Oh, okay, I see. Uh, As opposed to just sort of saying, okay, we now have an OD matrix of zone to zone. Yeah. We have we, we know the characteristics of each zone, so we've got a lot of information right there about the socioeconomics of the users. But um. Matt, drilling down to an individual level of this, I'm just sort of wondering what's. I mean, maybe it's. It's yeah. into Eric's models. I mean, that's, I, I, I'm just trying to think from a practical transit agency um, what you would do with it. Okay. Well, I mean, one of one of the reasons why it has done has been done by previous research is because um, sometimes these um, these are relied on the data from the household survey that is usually done for one day. Right. And. Uh, with the AFC data, we can look at the behavior of these passengers for long periods of time. So for instance, if a person reports on the survey that they made a trip to go to school and came back, uh, and let's say that went shopping and came back, we'll consider that as like a, a typical travel, but this might be just like a one day thing that the person did and reported, but it doesn't it doesn't show the the regular behavior of this passenger. Yeah, yeah I understand that. Okay. Okay. I mean, it's it's of course it's like a it's um it's a know, method that that it's hasn't proved to be very successful. But if we're able to get a better match, so for instance, if we ask the in the surveys in the travel surveys, if we ask for the smart card ID, we could see. Well, first we can see how what the person responded. If, if the person responds like, was that a initial trip or is that a regular trip? And then we can see the behavior of that person for, for longer than, than just what is collected by the, by the survey. Location of the... The origin. Or the origin. So whenever a passenger boards when when it gets on the bus uh, the system records the bus ID where, where the person is stopping on okay so then how do you know what the location of the bus is at the time that it taps on uh, so that's from the schedule so you're, you're asking me. Um, no so, so actually like in most systems yes you will count with AVL data and uh, you would see the time of the transaction and you would know where the bus is at. Uh, for Montevideo, we don't have AVL data. So basically, I mean, there has to be some sort of GPS from the um, AFC machine uh, to know where the bus is at, but also there's a person in the bus, uh, in addition to the driver, that monitors that uh, machine and makes sure that you know when people are tapping, they're getting the location where they're actually boarding. Um, so it's this is this is quite like a particular characteristic of, of the system in Montevideo, but but yeah, in general, you would use APL data. Okay. It's like, why are they recording that? Like for other AFC systems, or like for AFC systems where we've had to infer the origin because like that's not you know that's the way the system was designed to not work, mm -hmm. but like. Is this like a distance-based comparison? System? Like, why do they seem to care so much about collecting the exact location of where people are getting on when it's a time to trip? Well, well, that's an interesting location, and, and um, I mean, that's an interesting observation. And I, I've asked my question. I have asked the same question before, and what I've learned from these studies that AFC systems sometimes are particular. The data collected 
for Presto yeah. is different than the data collected in, let's say, um, DC. You know, there's there's, yeah. there's just like, like the, you know, there's not a standardized of collecting these data. So, so why um, I think they collect the location mm -hmm. is perhaps uh, so they get a receipt and if there's an inspector, they can show, okay, I boarded this uh, bus at this location. Okay. That's kind of like the only thing that seems reasonable. Talking to them, uh, they kind of like just answer, well, that's how our system is designed. Mm -hmm. um, so. Yeah, the answer is because. Because oh. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, so I went down to Mont Montevideo about this, get, to get this project going, and I, I don't know, but it could be because the whole, there's, the whole system is private operators, mm -hmm. many, many, many private operators, and they collect one fare, and then somewhere back in the back, they have some way of distributing the revenues out to all those operators somehow, right? So it's a very different system um, than, than we're used to, right? That's, yeah. that's probably right yeah. because the stop IDs are unique to each private operator, the runs of, of those operators, so then they can just add up all the ones that are on company A and company B. It's not TTC C. running around there, it's... Yeah, th there, were, there were like four private ones that now became yeah. like an integrated system. And that's why you have to tap on every time you transfer on like here where you just tap on yeah. one. Exactly. So, so, so our data set's not going to be as good. Um, <laughs> there would be just more uncertainty for, for estimating because, you know, you have to assume where, like what direction the person went. Um, so, yeah, so th that's... I'm sorry for the screen, but that's kind of like one of the reasons why we have such a high success rate for estimating a lot of things of, you know, over 90% per because uh, we have all the information about the, the transfers and all the top ones. Well, if you look at other studies, uh, there's inferences about like what direction the bus was going. Uh, you know, if they don't have to tap their card for transfers, they have to assume that there was a transfer. Uh, so, so things, things of that sort made our study uh, a little bit more, like a little bit easier, I would say. Okay, it's, it's more than ten minutes past the hour, so I think I think we will uh, bring it to a conclusion. Thank you very much.